IIT and NYU's Tandon School of Engineering, and a senior research scientist at the NYU Center for Responsible AI, which is exactly why we are here today. Mona is affiliated with the Tübingen AI Center in Germany, where she leads a three-year federally funded research project on the operationalization of ethics in German AI startups. She holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science and has completed fellowships at the University of California, Berkeley, and at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Mona will have uh, around 30 minutes of presentation, and I'm followed by my colleague uh, Nikolai Wolkowski on my left here to give a quick uh, uh, kind of reaction to her presentation. Uh, and then we open it up for, um, uh, for questions. I'm sorry for being a bit late this morning. Thank you very much, Mona, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eckhart. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor on, a, on this beautiful day here in Geneva. Um, we can see the mountains through the window, which is exciting to me. Um, you just introduced myself, so I don't have to do that. I can jump right in. Um, I will say, though, that I am a sociologist, so I study the social fabric of our everyday life and how it intersects with technology. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Um, essentially, um, when we look at artificial intelligence and the social, I want to encourage us to think about a point of departure or to hold on to that when we talk about AI uh, recruiting in the labor market. And that point of departure is that AI fundamentally expresses and constitutes social relations at this point. And it has really become integral to how we organize society, the technology itself, but also how we think and talk about that technology. Um, so whether we are aware of it or not, um, these kinds of technologies that we call AI are everywhere. Um, they're the autocorrect and fill-in features in our phones um, and word, word processing software, Word or Google Doc. I'm sure you all make use of that. Um, the content recommendation systems that show us posts we are more, most likely to engage on social media, the products we're likely to purchase on shopping sites, navigation applications, voice assistants such as Siri or Alexa, we are all AI users, whether we know it or not. Um, they are also um, increasingly entangled with the professions, um, professional practice, financial sector, think about high frequency trading um, or algorithmic trading. Um, where um, automated and pre-programmed trading instructions are used based on price, timing, and volume. I can, can probably tell you more than me about that. This has essentially changed the trade floor. We have algorithmic risk assessment systems that are used in um, the financial sector as well to assess loan applications, changing how loan officers assess credit worthiness and make credit decisions. We have the same picture in the insurance industry where we have natural language processing systems. Those are systems that analyze large amounts of natural language data, think about chat or Siri, to assess a client's insurance risk or to automatically detect fraud. That's actually a very popular business case in the insurance industry. Same with marketing, which um, uses a panoply of AI systems, targeted advertising, I'm sure. Um, you read and heard about the medical field has begun to embrace AI systems uh, in diagnostics and public health, clinical decision making, and social control. We had that recently with the pandemic. Do people wear masks in public transport and so on? But also in therapeutics and vaccine development and surveillance, operation of core clinical services, and so on. So that's just to kind of set the scene and say, well, it's kind of everywhere, and it's particularly in the professions. Um, what is AI really? This is a little um, comic strip that I love to show um, uh, to kind of start wrapping our head around that question. <clears throat> Today, we do not have an agreed upon definition of artificial intelligence, but we have some technical distinctions that we can draw upon. For example, we can distinguish between rule-based and learning-based AI systems. Um, the latter includes deep learning based on artificial neural networks. Um, the former is given a set of rules, chess rules, famous example, learns how to play best. Stock market uh, trading is a really good example. Um, 
the laggard learning systems are not given instructions. Um, if those detect patterns um, on their own and quote unquote make decisions based on those patterns. For example, whether or not a photo shows a cat. Um, but also um, all the hype GPT chat recently released, I'm sure you've heard about it, um, is also based on neural networks. Um, Many say that AI is just advanced statistics, which you can see it here, while others argue that it advances in data collection and computational capacity and so on, um, make AI its own league. So the jury is kind of still out on whether or not it's just statistics or not. <clears throat> I like this definition by uh, Jabra um, Bhatti. Um, who says that AI refers to a class of computer programs designed to solve problems, for example, requiring inferential reasoning, decision making based on incomplete or uncertain information, classification, optimization, and perception. And the reason why I like that definition is because it actually talks about the social, even though it doesn't state that, or it, 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 that's not in that definition. Um, and the reason for that is that um, Java really highlights the decision-making process. So the kind of purpose of AI is to assist or sometimes autonomously make decisions. And that is a social process. Usually for that reason, I like to talk about automated decision systems, not artificial intelligence, because it highlights the social function a little better. But AI is kind of something people understand a little bit better and kind of can use that as a segue into the discourse. So I'm going to stick with that definition for the purpose of this presentation. Now, AI is everywhere. We kind of said that. Um, but important is that AI increasingly mediates high stakes situations. Um, that means that there are different situations of course, that have different stakes for different populations of individuals, communities. Um, and that means that AI carries different risks for, di for these different uh, situations, but also populations. Now, a low stakes situation, um, and I use a comic that um, my wonderful colleague, Julia Stjanovic and Fala Khan have created here, um, which is part of a public uh, education course on AI called We Are AI. Um, I'm going to use this little coming strip to illustrate that AI that is deployed for prediction can, of course, make mistakes. We all know that we can't know the future. In low stake situation, for example, the Spotify algorithm making a recommendation that you don't like, or a shopping site making a recommendation for a pair of shoes that you really, you know, you buy, but you don't like. Um, the repercussions, quote unquote, of that predictions are not very severe. Um, you can just listen to another song or buy another pair of shoes. However, um, this changes when we are looking at high stakes situations, which can cause harm. And in the discourse, we can currently sort of distinguish between two different types of harms. We have allocative harms and we have presentational harms. The first one is about withholding uh, opportunity uh, for um, certain groups. And the second one is um, when kind of subordination is perpetuated in a system, for example, along the lines of race, class, gender, and so on. Now, these are not neatly distinct. They, of course, overlap and they kind of condition one another. Um, so these harms that can be caused, um, we can illustrate these harms can be uh, caused in high stakes situations. Um, and we can use a very famous example here, which I'm sure all of you know as well, autonomous vehicles, um, which have AI driven sensors that use computer vision technology. Um, and those sensors may not uh, be able to recognize a pedestrian who is pushing and not riding a bike across the road. That actually happened in 2018 in Phoenix, um, where Elaine Hertzberg was 
fatally hit by an Uber self-driving car whose driver was watching the show, The Voice, at the time. Now, interestingly, uh, a little um, side note, the driver was put on trial. So um, when these systems fail, we still are looking for a human uh, to kind of blame, put on trial, and so on. So that's really interesting to kind of observe here. Um, so we can actually say, well, you know, humans cause accidents too. In 2020 alone in the United States, there were uh, 107 team death um, by um, road accident per 1 million inhabitants, which is incredibly high. It's much lower in Germany, for example, or Japan. So maybe, you know, humans aren't necessarily better. Um, that's kind of a conversation we are still having with regards to the high stakes situations. Well, if we have these kinds of statistics, shouldn't we then let a machine decide if we know that humans aren't good? After all, we let planes, uh, we let machines fly planes. Um, but I'm kind of shifting gears a little bit and um, want to focus on the labor market. We can actually say that the similar type of situation occurs when we look at recruiting or the sourcing um, and assessing of talent. Um, and there is a, a panoply of technologies that are being used in that context. So whether or not somebody gets invited to an interview or is even shown a job ad, of course, is a high stakes situation as well. I think it's very important. And the reason why that is important is because we can then talk about harms which allows us to talk about regulation and potential laws in particular. This is the hiring funnel, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. Um, this is just a selection that I list here off AI um, uh, tools that are used. We have social media platforms. Think about LinkedIn, for example, that has um, candidate recommendation systems for recruiters. We have chatbots that are very popular that are used in recruiting to enhance the candidate experience. For example, we have resume parsers that actually tease out the relevant information from resumes because humans write resumes in different ways. Um, and it's kind of used to streamline that information. We have set rankers. So putting in um, information or search requests into a database and receiving rankings. I'm going to talk about that. We have psychometric assessments um, that are being used for candidates, for example, personality tests, game assessments, automated game assessments. Um, we have video interviewing tools that are very popular that help recruiters um, basically manage their time a little better. Uh, there is the AI function that can be piggybacked onto that. For example, um, and this is kind of a problematic case, emotion recognition technology and all of these things, as you can see speech and emotion analysis and many more. Um, if you are interested in how that pans out in the field, I encourage you to look at this conference, which is the a HR tech conference <laughs> that happens um, annually in Las Vegas, where um, all of these vendors actually exhibit. Um, so it's a good place, um, but even if you only go to the website to see kind of how that industry is using um, AI and thinking about that. Now, my one of my current research projects, not just uh, I do a bunch, but the, uh, a big one is actually studying the profession of recruiting and how they use uh, various AI systems in their work and importantly how they make sense of these outputs because we bring certain assumptions to the question how we should regulate AI in the context of employment and hiring but those assumptions are not now not necessarily evidence-based of course we don't know very much about how recruiters actually think about AI how they maybe question some of the out uh, of the outputs of the systems and so on and if we want to um, come up with a meaningful regulation and b meaningful responses to regulation, such as AI transparency or um, pathways to recourse. We actually ought to know how this unfolds in the field. Um, now, professional recruiting um, kind of uh, came out of a need of organizing labor 
at scale and early civilizations. Essentially, that's kind of the, the, the most common narrative that you can find on the history of um, recruiting. There were, of course, um, that military needs for strategic recruiting that um, assesses candidates specific to a task. So not just, oh, we just need a ton of labor to build this pyramid. I'm being very crude, of course. But we need specific abilities to perform specific tasks for a military operation. Um, that's, of course, um, uh, military and, and war related, but then importantly, kind of the strategic HR management um, really um, formed after World War II when there were a lot of returning soldiers who had to be reintegrated into the labor market. Um, and then the kind of number I wanna leave you with um, is that the US staffing and recruiting industry in 21 was at $136.4 billion. That's just the United States. Um, Staffing and recruiting are not exactly the same. Staffing is more about temporary um, workers that are placed in organizations. However, staffing agencies actually also do a lot of recruiting and can do uh, kind of large scale recruiting um, for more long term employment um, relationships between workers and organizations. Now, technology and recruiting have always been um, deeply entangled um, originally to assist the bureaucratic element, building up and archiving people resumes, often in filing cabinets. Um, some recruiters still reminisce about that when I talk to them. Marketing came later into play with various media being used to advertise vacant roles. Than the telephone did, and, and it still does play a major role. Recruiters do want to talk to people in person, interestingly enough. Um, and while the bureaucratic tasks were always prone to automation, the assessment of candidates has uh, also increasingly become technology mediated to as you just heard. And that can be based on pseudoscience, um, such as personality uh, assessment tools that kind of create a personality profile of a candidate, and then based on that, um, create a job score or a job fit score, and then make a recommendation uh, to recruiters. Um, today, um, very broadly, technology helps recruiters address two challenges. One is finding suitable candidates in extremely competitive labor markets, um, expert uh, experts, essentially. Those are not, of course, just white collar workers. Those are also blue collar workers in certain uh, situations. Um, that's a low volume recruiting situation. That's how they talk about that. Um, or they use technology to cope with large numbers of applications for certain positions, um, which is high volume recruiting. So that's staffing, of course, but that is also things such as um, internships or entry level positions that uh, young people apply for or uh, jobs in the service industry where it's a, there's a big turnaround. Um, the problem is of course that the tools that um, recruiters use in both high volume and low volume recruiting can reinforce inequality um, because they have, um, for example, certain biases. This is just a selection of news reporting that has been going on on the topic. So a, a, a famed example is the um, biased display of job ads based on gender or the um, famous Amazon tool. That was a 2018 headline where the tool was predicting the future success uh, of a candidate and kind of learned or taught itself that um, the word anything with women in it was predicting um, that the candidate wouldn't be successful. So for example, women's soccer team uh, and things like that. There's, called, there's of course, um, anti-black bias uh, in recruiting. Um, th th there's critical reporting and also research that I have conducted on automated personality testing um, and so on. So it's been, um, uh, going on for a while now that we've been learning about bias in recruiting AI, and we increasingly have regulatory efforts that um, seek to address that. So, for example, in New York City, we have the, um, the it's called the Hiring Bill, uh, which regulates um, 
automated employment decision tools in both hiring and employment. Um, so also within the organization context, not just onboarding people. Um, and that bill actually asks that job candidates are notified if an AI is used uh, in, in any uh, point of the process of finding them and assessing them, A, and two, um, how it actually works, which is a huge socio-technical challenge, of course. Um, and then it also mandates regular bias audits. Before that, we had the Illinois uh, Artificial Intelligence Video, Video Interview Act come into effect in 2020, um, which kind of has, a, has similar mandates. Um, um, which led to kind of actually a decrease in the use of AI elements in video or interviewing software. So the emotion recognition uh, systems. Recruiters still use that, of course, um, to save time so they don't have to schedule interviews, um, but that's actually changed the industry a little bit. Of course, we have the EUAI that we expect to come into effect um, early, well, sometime this year, I should say which classifies uh, hiring AI as a high risk um, AI application, which means that it has to have a um, ex anti and ex post assessment. So pre-market deployment assessment and the regular uh, post-market deployment assessments. Um, and then for example, the EOC, and our all, all friend Keith Sonderly put out um, a primer that warned um, against disability discrimination in AI tools. So for example, um, game assessment. So uh, how fast can you blow up a virtual balloon on a screen and things like that. I can talk a little bit more. Um, which leads me kind of to um, the data and learning I wanna share with you now on my ongoing study on AI and recruiting, uh, which is a qualitative study. Um, I focus on low volume recruiting for now. So the finding of rare talent, um, and the assessment of our talent, not on um, high volume recruiting just now. And so that is called sourcing. Um, where do you source uh, talent? And these are just some, um, I think, um, important research questions. There are a few more that kind of drive the project, but these are about um, the professional practice of sourcing, um, discretionary decision making, and the question how does that actually change discretionary power of sourcing? professionals and how does this actually affect accountability, which of course is something that regulators are interested in. And I'm just gonna share a few learnings now um, before we wrap and start the discussion. Now, sourcing is a very meticulous research and relationship building process. When you ask recruiters about how they do that, they say it takes time and skill. Um, so they have very intricate strategies um, of kind of sniffing out people online, on job platforms, on events, and their personal networks, and so on. Um, uh, hanging out in virtual spaces, especially if you are sourcing technical talent, for example, in game design, there are places that recruiters go to find these people. Um, and all of that they say is very much about a relationship building process, as you can say, these are quotes. Um, from the study. And the reason why I put this last quote in there, the job itself is very much like a relationship building process. That is kind of the social um, dynamic that recruiters find AI can't do for them, which is interesting. Um, <clears throat> however, um, and this is, you know, unpublished work um, or soon to be published work, Recruiters think like computers when they look for people, when they source for people uh, in very interesting ways. And they use Boolean searches. I don't know if you've heard about Boolean searches. I'm going to explain that in a second. Um, when you ask, how do you find people? They say, oh, I do a Boolean search on a database. So that can be um, LinkedIn, so a social media platform, which they actually treat as a database that updates itself is why they like it because people keep their tend to keep their profiles up to date um, but they also have a very extensive applicant tracking systems which i'm sure you've heard about these are internal systems um, that store candidate data of anybody who has ever submitted an application or they have sourced ever some of these applicant tracking systems are humongous databases of hundreds of thousands of people um, and that data is maintained by recruiters 
And those applicant tracking systems also have increasingly have AI, AI capabilities. Um, so they use Boolean searches. Now, what is Boolean um, searches? Um, essentially, what happens when a recruiting process or sourcing process, I should say, starts is that a recruiter um, gets a job description from a hiring manager that's either newly written or it is repurposed um, and slightly edited. They can be formal um, or informal, just a conversation with a hiring manager who says, hey, I need uh, you know, a UX designer for this new project that I have to deliver in, I don't know, next year, Q4. Um, from that job specification, um, uh, a job description, a formal job description is um, created. And what recruiters then do is they scan that job description for keywords. Um, and these keywords are actually where the rubber, the sourcing rubber hits the road um, because they've used that to um, build these Boolean searches. Um, when they look at a job description, they always look at it through the Boolean lens. So they will look at a job survey and say, okay, um, UX design, um, uh, Metropolitan Area of Geneva, um, NGO, those are the kind of keywords that I'm looking for here. Um, George Boole is a, or was a mathematician, just a little um, side note, who interestingly enough, or importantly enough, um, established um, modern symbolic logic um, or Boolean algebra, which is actually the basis of digital computer circuits. So computers think of the way in which computer circuits work. Um, they um, are used to retrieve information um, and instead of arithmetic operators, addition, subtraction, subtraction, and multiplication, there are three logical operators that are used and or and not. And Boolean logic is essentially concerned with the relationship between things. Um, and that relationship can either be true or false. So you can either have a degree uh, in graphic design or not, or you can base a medical in the area of Geneva or not. I illustrate that with a, a little example here, um, which you um, can read because I'm, uh, I'm pressing ahead so we can have a bit of a dis uh, discussion. Um, so and, or, and not, keep in mind, and this can be true or false. Um, and this actually is a Boolean search that is a real one that was given to me by a recruiter. Um, and this is essentially the way in which they find people. So you have at the top a real word string um, that is somebody, there's a technical sourcer who is looking for uh, somebody who can do Python and R. Um, then this recruiter put in different softwares that they want um, them to have experience in. Um, and they kind of use this to um, really find the most relevant people. Um, they also have different search string fragments that they just store somewhere. Sometimes they share that with their teams um, that they find very useful. Um, and they also use Boolean searches to actually um, quote unquote source for diversity. Um, that is kind of the tool through which they think they can create more equitable um, representation in what they call the slate, which is the presentation of candidates to their future. So the third one you can see um, we have women in, so women in AI, women in tech, and so on. Bryce Hopper, which is an org and a, uh, obviously a, a, a historical figure, but the and, you know, uh, the org, for example, uh, and so on. And so this is the, um, the Boolean logic is the way in which um, recruiters or, or AI and technology-driven recruiting can actually um, be leveraged for more diversity from the perspective of recruiters. Now, what is important to know is that Boolean searches do not necessarily require AI. You can do that Boolean search with any database. You don't need a, a, a predictive element in there. However, um, of course, there are increasingly predictive elements in any of these databases. As I said earlier, ATS increasingly have um, AI systems. If, if you do a Boolean search on in LinkedIn Recruiter, which is the, the recruiter product of LinkedIn, um, you may have things such as um, is most likely to reply to your in-mail um, that plays a role, not just the keyword. 
Uh, and so the um, introduction of AI-driven recommendation in sourcing actually increases opacity in candidate search for recruiters. They're very used to you know, knowing how Boolean search works. It's, you know, very well established, it's been around for a while. Now you kind of add on AI into these searches and they don't know what they get. They can get, you know, with the exact same search string, one slate of people one day and the other another day. So there's an increasing opacity that they can't really get their head around and they have to spend some time to play around with the keywords to kind of gauge what the AI is actually doing there. So the introduction of AI um, is increasing the opacity for them. And so that is actually a socio-technical challenge um, if you wanna address that and if you wanna address that um, also with kind of regulation in mind. We need to create transparency to enhance the professional discretion in the age of AI. And of course, that's not just um, for recruiting. So um, recruiters, as I said, think um, they don't really know how AI search works, and they also think it is biased and therefore not very trustworthy. So it's not necessarily that, at least in low volume recruiting, we have a situation where, you know, any and all recruiters just take uh, the outputs at face value. Not at all. They actually sometimes spend significant time kind of double checking what the AI is doing. Um, when it comes to addressing that challenge, this is um, from forthcoming work together with Judith Stjanovic and Arita Gupta uh, and a few others, um, as a forthcoming paper on introducing contextual transparency. Um, and this is contextual transparency um, for recruiting. So the question of what exactly do we need to be transparent about in any kind of given professional situation, such as recruiting. Um, <laughs> this is kind of evidence-based in that it is grounded on, uh, it's grounded in social research, for example, the kind of research that I'm doing. And based on that, we would actually suggest that the, uh, the, the transparency unit um, that recruiters are used to and that makes most sense actually is a Boolean search strength because they are using that. And this is, this is the, the way in which um, recruiters um, interact um, with candidate profiles. And so we can then go and explain um, the passive uh, factors, the passive influential factors of any given ranking. Um, so general influential factors um, of any um, product such as LinkedIn Recruiter. So for example, do they take generally into account recruiter activity on LinkedIn, candidate activity on LinkedIn, the geography, um, how do generally Boolean keywords and search fragments play a role? Um, we could also add um, certain population demographics per job title here as well to just show um, how um, kind of skewed towards certain demographics certain um, uh, jobs are. We could also attempt to explain active elements. So the specific keyword influence per Boolean search or we can um, try and engage in interranking explanation. For example, what is the difference between candidate on the first and on the fifth uh, place, or on you know everybody on page one versus everybody on page ten? Um, we can do those things without having to actually necessarily explain the whole algorithmic system. Um, another challenge or issue is that AI it cannot assess transferable skills. Um, sometimes they are called soft skills, but not only. This is particularly important for entry-level positions. So if you have a student who's applying for an internship, they don't have work experience. So recruiters um, mainly look at a, at a resume and kind of gauge those transferable um, skills. Um, that means that candidate assessment really remains a manual task. That also means that despite this humongous uh, AI market and recruiting, we still have lots of potential for bias because manual checking <laughs> is used to actually um, make up for what AI, they think AI fails in. So we're not really solving the problem. Here. Um, and that's the second socio-technical challenge. So we might wanna think about introducing formalized processes to um, make professional discretion as a whole not just as either a social or a technical process, more accountable in the age of AI. And I'm gonna leave it at that and um, 
happy to talk more about any of this, but um, also very happy to take questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mona. Uh, before we open the floor, I will give uh, the floor to uh, my colleague Nicola for some comments, and I would invite all of those who are online in particular to maybe start already populating the chat box with your uh, with your question that you have, so that you yeah. can immediately jump into a Q and A right after. Right, please. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you, Mona, for this very interesting presentation. I'm glad you're here on such a nice day. At least you can see some snow on Jura, yeah. which is unusual this winter. And if you have a have some time, go to the mountains because it will melt tomorrow. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I saw the presentation last night only, uh, so I prepared in advance some comments based on whatever little I know about this, this topic. Uh, mainly from uh, um, the perspective of uh, hiring uh, as an HR function. And uh, now, after uh, your presentation, first of all, I learned a lot. And second, I see that uh, uh, what I prepared in advance are not very different from what we were presenting. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're on the same page, if not that, you know. Um, you know, hiring was always problematic, right? If you compare with other HR functions, training, uh, work organization, uh, retention, performance management, because I mean, hiring mistake costs a lot. And uh, um, you know, the methods were always Question. I mean, um, well, I was a PhD student at Wharton uh, University of Pennsylvania 30 years ago, and uh, I was a student of scientific management at that point. Fascinating stuff. I was even working part time in the Center for Human Resources, which used to be known as Industrial Relations Unit, that was founded by Frederick Taylor. <laughs> so, so, but now I work for the ILO, I imagine what kind of revolution uh, um, I had to go through. Uh, and I just recall, I think it's Frederick Taylor himself or one of his students described hiring practices in Eastern Pennsylvania at the steel plants back in the you know, early 20th, uh, 20th century. There was a fantastic test, uh, method called Apple test. Mm -hmm. So when you know, a bunch of candidates, mainly unskilled workers, immigrants, gather outside of the factory gates, the supervisor, or I can say probably hiring manager, would go out and will throw an apple into the crowd, right? Whoever gets an apple gets a job. So how scientific this method, well, okay, you can say that, you know, you need certain skills to catch the apple and not allow you know, other people to catch the apple, fine. But from the very beginning, there were two big issues. Uh, one is um, how do we know we're hiring the best? And second, how do we make sure we're not discriminating? Of course, discriminating back in 2019 uh, was not an issue. <laughs> so let's, let's make no mistake about that. Of course, things have formalized maybe after the World War II. As you said, there was a big um, change in terms of recruiting practices, in terms of methods used, uh, psychological tests, and you know things like that. Uh, but you know the, the the system was more or less standard. Okay, start with job description, uh, job analysis, then ads and applicants, uh, then screening, then done mainly by HR, and that created a lot of issues because HR managers were not necessarily uh, familiar with employment context, and the the linear managers, line managers, was always complaining about that. Um, and then uh, hiring process using a lot of methods like. Uh, you know, interviews, I mean, you mentioned some of them. And, and by the way, there's the best literature suggesting that uh, like interviews is probably the worst method in terms of predictive validity. Uh, but we're still using it. I mean, I just saw a report that uh, after COVID, the time spent on interviews by managers in the US increased by 20%. So, uh, and I go back to Amazon case that you mentioned in your presentation because my brother which just got a job last year with Amazon in the Silicon Valley and he had to go through a lot of unstructured interviews uh, <laughs> after Amazon dropped this algorithm back in 2000. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah I mean the, the two major I mean the major issue was okay I mean Asian managers were not viewed as uh, experts but then of course the machines and those people who are developing machines now these algorithms are even less of experts uh, when it comes to employment context in a particular firm, but I'll talk about this a little bit later. The good news was that uh, a lot of recruitment was done from within. Uh, internal candidates were given priorities in, in 
in many instances. And, and that's good, both in terms of institutional knowledge point of view and discrimination, non-discrimination point. Now, of course, everything has changed now. I mean, the relationship between candidates and, um, and deployers become very unclear, right? I mean, the people are applying just in case and uh, the employers are um, hiring just in case. I mean, people are playing just in case. Even 20 years ago, when the introduction of this monster comb and other platforms, I, I read an article saying that on Monday morning in the US, 2002, maybe 2003, uh, there were 4 million uh, resumes sent to monster. You know, people come to work after the weekend, they hate their job, uh, mm -hmm. they're looking for something, whatever. So they just send it somewhere. But now, of course, from the employer's point of view, we see a lot of cases when uh, you know companies are looking for passive candidates. I mean, there was uh, some studies showing that a lot of people who are not searching for jobs are, are given offers from the companies. Sometimes companies, are, it's not a secret, they're using fake ads just to make sure that they attract the best people without knowing what to do with them, but they wanna make sure that they get the best people available on the market. Um, so in this situation with you know, unlimited number of candidates, what do the companies do? I mean, you describe some of the methods, but in general, of course, outsourcing, right? I mean, uh, I, I, I think there was a recent study by, by Gordon Ferry, uh, get hunting company, that was uh, in the US, um, 40 percent of US companies have outsourced much of the hiring, uh, to, uh, to the guys like Adepo Manpower, and they in turn outsource to, uh, companies in development in countries like India and the Philippines, who are doing things that you described and going to the, to the social media, LinkedIn. By the way, there's a huge concern about privacy when it comes to all these methods, but that's, that's a separate talk, separate story. We can talk about this later. Some companies are still doing their own recruitment and hiring, but they're also using this army of vendors who are getting together in Vegas twice a year, maybe more. Uh, I think there are more than 100 vendors only in the US who are selling these uh, smart uh, tools. And uh, the problem is with all these tools, as far as I understand, is that they inherit the same biases and problems that uh, the traditional system had. Um, and uh, you mentioned, uh, well, first of all, you know, employment context, because they don't quite understand what's going on. And the evolution is hard to evaluate. And second, uh, discrimination, because some of these methods are using past performance, uh, a good performance approach, right? So they look at the attributes of those people who are successful, and uh, they believe that you should be hiring similar, right? And like Amazon, the problem with Amazon was that um, traditionally, like, you know, the majority of Amazon employees were white male. So you cannot, I mean, it's, <laughs> but by definition, I mean, the best performance should be white male. So all the attributes they had were attributed to uh, the candidates and the, the results, female and, uh, and minority candidates were not successful. And Amazon could not uh, fix it. And they, as you said, they they, they dropped this uh, algorithm. I, I heard about one company, and I think it was published, but not not in scientific uh, article, but somewhere in the New York Times or something. Company that was using, um, they were, you know, conscious about not using gender or race as the attributes. But then they were looking at the characteristics, the attributes, right? I mean, reported by by best performance, and one of them was playing rugby. So as a result, you get the same, right? Because I mean, who's playing rugby? White male. But though it's kind of interesting to 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 say about this about this in this room, hundred percent white and eighty percent male. <laughs> but that's a footnote. Um, on top of that, the problem is that um, we don't really know whether they actually produce good hires. I mean, again, there is a study that shows that in the U.S., only one third of the companies actually monitor. Uh, whether or not uh, their hiring practices lead to good employees. And the final point I'd like to make is um, about, uh, and you mentioned some of the use of artificial intelligence in, the, in marketing and in other domains, and HR is still, still a huge gap between the expectations and what we see, not only in hiring, but in particular in hiring. And uh, there are a number of things that can explain that. You know, first, it's complexity of HR phenomenon. For example, I mean, how do you find a good employer, employee? Second, uh, question of accountability associated with fairness, um, ethical, legal constraints, and mentioned some of the legal issues, and then possible negative reaction uh, um, of employees and society to management decisions based on algorithm. 
So from the ILO perspective, uh, I guess that employee engagement direct or, or through representatives could probably address some of these issues. And also, once again, um, um, I'd like to go back to the issue of hiring interim candidates. It's a very good practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Excellent. Uh, so for a moment, I don't see any burning question in the chat. Is there any question here? Otherwise, I would uh, first give the floor back to one. Yes, Jenny. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot for your presentation. Really interesting. So I have two questions, um, and they're very distinct. The first one, one is if the LinkedIn database was working well with the Boolean queries, why did they add on the AI? So if you have any insight into that. And the second is, well, it's kind of more of a comment and question. Um, you mentioned you had done some research on personality tests, which mm -hmm. I think are really well, problematic and also fascinating to, to study. The way I kind of see this whole AI recruiting is that we know, you know, it's okay. It's, we all know that it's, there's biases already. It's just magnifying the biases. But I see it more as really this is a tool that is actually a threat to the recruiters in a sense because it can replace a lot of their work. And it's also just in line with a lot of the tech inventions, which are basically, you know, what some researchers call heteromated labor in the sense that we are end up doing the work that that staff used to do, whether it be at the, the checkout in the, in the grocery store or, or, or buying our airplane ticket yeah. or all of these things. And so this is just one more step and the personality tests being one facet of this step. And I think that that's particularly a problem in the high volume recruiting. So the entry level, I guess, which would probably be used in warehouse work and not the service jobs. So to me, this is kind of more the issue. It's just more work. So now everybody has to go on and fill out these forms. Mm -hmm. Don't ever apply for a job at the UN. The form is absolute nightmare. You know, and so you can, you know, so you can get into the database. So then the database can search everything. And then on top of that, you know, if you're if you're looking in for an entry level job, you have to do not only do you have to do these horrible forms, but then you have to do these really degrading tests. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I guess it's kind of a comment, <laughs> but I wanted yeah. to hear, but I wanted to hear a little bit about your research on the personality tests. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Nicola. I really appreciate it. I have a few um, questions I'll, I'll come back on. All right. So why introduce AI-driven um, recommendation systems if LinkedIn worked well? Good question. I think um, we need to look at this um, through the lens of, we talked about this yesterday, marketization, the creation of a market um, that becomes profitable. I mean, LinkedIn was bought by um, Microsoft for $1 billion. It was a huge deal, yeah. literally, <laughs> um, at the time. So um, I think it is it is about um, market competition and creating that particular um, AI-driven marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, um, one, two, it is about... Um, dealing with that humongous database, um, which is, you could argue, too too large for anybody's good at this point. Mm -hmm. There's so many people on LinkedIn. It's a, it's a vast database. And um, because recruiters for the, especially for the passive candidate, the sourcing um, element are, and this is LinkedIn particular, um, increasingly frustrated with the volume um, that originally used to be a unique selling point, um, they feel that search no longer works well, and they do what they call a Google X-ray search. So they will actually use some of the search strings that I showed in a Google search, and then you can just put site, and you, know, you can search LinkedIn externally through Google search, because they feel that Google does search better then LinkedIn. It's just a little bit of a you know anecdote where they see the kind of market developing. Um, so I think the, the the yeah the answer is to that is marketization, like creating this marketplace. Then the personality testing. I absolutely loved your comment on the human infrastructure that that is in place to kind of uphold these systems and do all the labor that's required mm -hmm. uh, here. Um, Personality testing, I'm happy to share um, that paper. We did a um, stealth audit of two uh, automated personality testing tools that are currently on the market, Humantic and Crystal. And we did so based on a um, holistic uh, or interdisciplinary audit framework. Um, because if you go in and test um, how accurate is the algorithm, 
as an audit methodology, you will end up with a narrative whereby companies may say, oh, we'll just make it better. <laughs> we'll just make it more accurate. Um, but sometimes you have these fundamentally problematic, racist, discriminatory um, pseudoscientific constructs that are operationalized in systems that cause the algorithm to quote unquote not um, do well. And so the framework, um, that paper is called Silicon Valley Loft Triangle. I'm happy to share that. It means that you assess um, the assumptions that underpin any AI tool, in this case, personality. The basic assumption is that personality is something, is a construct that is stable enough that it can be assessed across time, across input, and so on. And so if you actually test against that, you can um, create a stronger narrative where, where you say, well, there's a problematic and pseudoscientific assumption that is operationalized, and that is why it doesn't quote unquote work. So you can use that to weed out bad tech. And we, for example, discovered that for, uh, uh, for those tools, um, that for example, depending on whether or not you would upload your resume in a PDF or a work form, your personality score was changing, for example. Um, so that's all to say, yeah, well, they, we, we can actually say, yeah, then we have to do the labor of auditing that stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but thank you, thank you for those comments. Excellent, so we have two more questions here in the room, yeah, Pavel? Yeah, right. So I have one question or comment maybe that goes, I think, in, a little bit in the direction of or the answer of why to introduce AI. And that's just maybe also a suggestion to look into. But basically, I think when we talk about this Boolean world, Mr. Bull got a lot of free ride from Aristotle's <laughs> initial work. So probably it's worth crediting him for that. And, and essentially, that branch of maths was considered completely useless at the time that it was published mm -hmm. until computing came in and programming came in. And I think beyond the three operators that you mentioned in your presentation, what really matters to this Boolean logic that's used in the searches is the whole notion of other operators, which are the parentheses, the quotation marks, brackets, asterisks. So all the programming notion of rejects that comes, the regular expressions that come with it. And that first of all, rejects is quite complicated for people without programming training to do on their own. By the way, GPT chat does it very well, specify. So if you want to search for names, emails, starting with a letter, ending with something, having a space and finishing it org. Most people cannot write that expression easily. GPT chat sorts it quite well by now, but in general, that requires programming skills to do that. And then specifying a model with those searches manually becomes really cumbersome because the order of these operators matters. And whether you have brackets and parentheses and how the ors and ends are specifies completely changes the search. So when you introduce an algorithm into that, it's a little bit like specifying a machine learning model versus a traditional regression model, where in the first you have to spend so much time explaining all the statistical assumptions and so on. And you just, in a machine specification, you just wrap a k-fold number of machine learning model around your data and you keep running it in different sizes uh, without all these assumptions, but you can basically specify all permutations, all combinations of variables, and you use a brute force approach. So my guess is that this is a big advantage there. You can basically specify models for searches that do not require a major programming experience, but you can just put the keywords, and that the algorithm not only can specify a much bigger specification with all different operators, but also it can learn from what are useful specifications and throw away the less useful ones. But it starts with a big net that is much, much more powerful than manual specification. And my second question is uh, that these Boolean systems and searches would seem to me they work both ways. So there are also services that offer people, you know, possibilities of adjusting your CV to job descriptions that are on LinkedIn and other places. So what's your take on that? Because you didn't mention it, but obviously when you mentioned the impact on inequality, I can immediately think of one stemming from that because people with better level of education with higher income will be able to access and pay for those services, uh, whereas others probably won't. So you immediately have a spread in terms of how people even prepare their profile if it becomes automated. And of course, uh, 
yeah, that that will have an implication for for inequality. So I'm, my question is really about this other side of the uh, of yeah the candidates yeah. scanning for jobs. Uh, would you mind taking Rania's question and yeah. then you can you can I give you the last one the last one. Yeah. yeah. And if you want. Yes. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I think my question is probably a little bit based on the comments that were made um, by Nikolai. Um, my question is, um, don't you think, or do you think that the criticism that is raised against AI in recruiting, doesn't it apply one-to-one -to, -one to recruiting by human beings? So aren't they basically doing exactly the same thing, just the AI uses more data um, the reason why I'm saying this is, as far as I know, I'm not an HR expert, but the problem is that the question like who is or what is a good employee, there is no real answer to that, right? The humans don't have an answer to that either. So as far as I know, a lot of recruiting is like based on rule of thumbs, you know, let's go to whoever who went to an Ivy League school, those will be good candidates who work for this company, those will be good candidates those that study a long time, what, whatever. But so probably if you ask a lot of recruiters, uh, 10 of them, they would give you 10 different answers about what is a good employee. And these algorithms are kind of just replicating what the recruiters are doing with, 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 with much more data. So that's why you have the same biases and the same kind of problems. That's... I just want to have a direct follow-up on that um, so I think the, the algorithms that are replicating what recruiters have been doing in the past, because they're looking at the past data, while uh, um, the, the biases of recruiters could change potentially by through educating recruiters, they could change their biases over time. And why the algorithm won't do that, because the algorithm is learning from the past. So, so it's, I think it's probably it's harder to untrain a bias from an algorithm than from a, from a recruiter. In your answer to these questions, can you also uh, you know integrate what I just got into the chat, which is uh, are you aware of any application that are actually trying to address these these biases and and or what would be your suggestion to address them? Yeah. Um, thank you. And then you, you have the, the last one. Okay, great. So um Yes, the bigger net initially, of course. Um, some recruiters actually um, use the learning function um, for their own good. You know, they say, well, I just repeatedly use that search string and then I make an effort to click profiles that are maybe not the ones that I actually want to put into my slate, but I train mm -hmm. the algorithm. But this is all kind of, those, those are vignettes, those are lay knowledges, right? This is what they kind of feel is what the algorithm does. It's not evidence-based, but they they do use Boolean uh, and AI-driven search in tandem in that way, for example. So that's just a, a little bit of information. Now. The candidate side, yeah, I mean, there we have that um, kind of quote-unquote problem at, at our universities when we train our students to go into the labor market, like our career centers teach students how to um, behave online, how to write resumes. There are obviously huge cultural differences uh, in that as well. Um, people behave differently on LinkedIn, uh, depending on what culture they're from and so on. Um, there are services that, that kind of uh, help with that keyword um, element. Recruiters don't believe in those, <laughs> at least the ones I spoke to. They said there's, you know, there's there are these myths out, you know, circulating that you can um, optimize your uh, resume so that it shores up at the top of the ranking. Again, I'm talking passive candidates, low volume recruiting, right? Not um, uh, high volume recruiting. Um, they tend to say, I manually check anyway. So there's this kind of emphasis of the human knowledge over the machine knowledge and recruiting, which I'm sure has lots to do with fears of automation, uh, but also with kind of evidence-based um, data. They, they don't think that it necessarily saves them time and therefore money. So um, that's what I, that's kind of what I hear that again, but you could say, well, this is a marketization effort, right? Like there'd be services that are sold to these people uh, within think it. <laughs> 
is treated um, in a preferential way. Um, same bias with or without AI. It's not the same. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say. I think that um, we can all agree that recruiting and you know any HR function is profoundly biased, human bias, but the difference is the scale, right? Like you have uh, maybe a one-on-one -on -one situation, whereas algorithmic systems are scaled up. So they actually scale and, and amplify inequity. So for example, if you think about game-based assessment that discrim could potentially discriminate against neurodivergent candidates, like that happens not just one-on-one, -on -one. you know, you, you bring people in for an assessment center and then you have maybe five this happens at scale. Um, and so scale is one thing. The other thing is, again, marketization. You have a whole industry that is kind of on the narrative that this actually works. Um, and there are new tools thrown at recruiters all the time, um, especially in these large companies, Conferry, Adeco, and so on, where they buy licenses for the whole company and then recruiters, quote unquote, have to work with those. So um, I think... Originally, maybe it's the same, but you have people from outside of HR coming into the into those markets and co-creating these markets that again know very little uh, about any of that what's going on. I will also add to that that the recruiting and hiring process is a process of distributed decision making between different people and between humans and machines. So you have the hiring manager, of course, you have the recruiter, um, you have very many uh, division of labor at this point. So I think um, that's why we need to look at the question of professional, like the process of professional discretion, right? Where does this happen? Uh, and how are decisions actually influenced? So where does, what kind of bias come in and what kind of harms? Because harms is actually something you can then litigate, at least in the United States, if that makes sense. Um, who's a good employee? Um, that's not something recruiters actually are concerned with. <laughs> They're concerned with, at least the folks I spoke to, who will be hired, which is a different question. How likely is it that the hiring manager will hire somebody I put on the slate? It's not their problem, especially if you have agency recruiting um, versus like in-house corporate recruiting whether or not this is a good candidate, actually. Um, and then um, changing the algorithm. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of assumptions use the personality tool are solidified in these systems. And they are um, the problem with AI systems, which is why I set it up in the way in which I did, is they are, we would call this infrastructural. So they are actually hidden from view. They you know, mediate, but we don't know how, where, and when. And so that means we can't actually um, even think about meaningful changes, which is something regulators now have to grapple with and always a little bit behind with that. So I think um, it's hard to change the machine, but it's also hard to change uh, the socio-technical process. Um, and so kind of, I think that very uh, targeted interventions, for example, a uh, contextual transparency, one that I briefly spoke about, can kind of accumulate to more meaningful change. Um, somebody asked about whether there are um, tools out there that are addressing bias. There is... Uh, I got off. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is... Oh, yes, right. That was a <laughs> So um, the interesting thing about uh, recruiting and hiring AI is that these tools are actually sold under the premise that this is going to fix bias. Um, uh, and there is, if you look at um, racial uh, equity, there is, for example, Seek Out, which is a tool. That, I mean, I don't know if you've heard about that. They actually use natural language processing, as far as I understand, um, to identify proxies for um, minority identifiers. So, um, it's, if somebody, for example, went to a historically black college, they are more likely to be black. So um, this is a diversity tool that um, recruiters like to use to hit their diversity targets, which are increasingly uh, introduced, which is why they come up with these, you know, search strings that are diversity focused also. So there are increasingly is 
again, marketization going on around diversity. Um, recruiting. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was great. Wonderful. Uh, so thanks a lot to all of you who are still online. Sorry for running a bit over, but I think it was definitely worth it. And we want to thank you here again, Mona, for coming, visiting us, and hopefully stay in touch with us for more, for more of this topic. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And thank uh, you so much. Good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's very <laughs> uh, Almost 50. Oh, good. Yeah. Good.